లక్ష్మీనాథ సమారంభాం నాదయామున మధ్యమాం అస్మదాచార్య పర్యంతం వందే గురు పరంపరాం యోనిత్యమచ్యుత పతాంబుజ యుక్మరుక్మ వ్యామోహద స్థితరాణి త్రిణాయమేనే అస్మద్గురోర్భగవతోస్య దయేక సింధో రామానుజ చరణౌ శరణం ప్రపథ్యే ప్రణాంస్ టు ద లార్డ్ ప్రణాంస్ టు ఆల్ ద ఆచార్యస్ ప్రణాంస్ టు ద మహాత్మాస్ అసెంబుల్ హియర్ we are all here today to relish chapter 3 of the bhagavad gita karma yoga today's society has been built on the foundation of the fundamental belief that personal greed leads to public good personal greed leads to public good this has overridingly defined the very concept of progress and success in our society however all the ills of today can be traced to this very belief stress breakdown of relationships disharmony intolerance conflicts among nations are shaking the very foundation of humanity and driving mankind to the very brink of disaster therefore there is a need to rethink our fundamental beliefs there is a need for the gita to flow into our hearts and our minds there is a need for lord krishna to orchestrate our lives our scriptures clearly declare when we take care of the larger good our personal good is automatically taken care of the more and more we add value to others the more and more valuable our life becomes none of us are useless it is just that we are used less and we all can use ourselves completely only when we start living a life that is useful to others once upon a time a man was walking in the desert he still had miles to go he spotted a hand pump a note was stuck on the hand pump and it read pour all the water you have got into the pump and pump vigorously it will give you in return enough to fill your bottle the man was in a dilemma he knew the water he was left with in his water can was not enough for him to survive the rest of the distance in the sand dunes however if he poured everything he had got into the pump and if nothing came off from the hand pump he would be left with nothing he decided to trust the note and go ahead so he poured all that he had into the pump and vigorously started pumping as if his entire life depended on it of course his life depended on it after some nerve wracking moments water did gush from the pump he not only had enough to quench his thirst but also had enough to fill his water can he was now certain that he would survive the entire distance he took out his pen and added to the note it works it really works the moral of the story if you want everything from life you got to first give everything you have got to life At the end of first chapter Arjuna was despondent completely deluded he was troubled by the impending death of his loved ones in the war and this led him to think and believe that he should not fight the war a confused Arjuna was looking up to Krishna for answers in the back of his mind was his duty to fight as a soldier and also the stories of all the atrocities of the kauravas arjuna was in need for clear direction he was asking krishna to tell him the one right thing to do arjuna was an intelligent person he had given many valid reasons as to why fighting was not the right thing to do krishna simply smiled he then took arjuna through the second chapter sankhya yoga wherein 
he described the nature of the Atman, the individual soul, the essence of our being. While our experiences are ever fluctuating, ever changing, constant contraries and constant opposites, swinging between hope and despair, joy and sorrow, elation and depression, agitations caused by unfulfilled desires and craving for things, irritability, annoyance, anger, fear, worry, anxiety and jealousy. The reality is we are by nature, by our original constitution, free from all these things. The individual soul has no afflictions, no hunger, no thirst, no sleep, no fatigue, no death, no destruction. The Atman within the embodiment, the soul within the human body has no pain, has no pleasure, no distress, no agitation, no worry, no anxiety. We are by nature full of perfection, complete in ourselves, lacking nothing, full of joy, full of peace, full of bliss, eternal. Then how come that our experiences from morning till night seem to contradict this fact? What is the reason for this? We can look at the analogy of a perfectly clear crystal which is transparent and pure but becomes filled as it were with some color if some colored object is brought forth near it. The object thus brought forth may be a green colored ball or a little red colored flower and the whole crystal becomes green or red. This proximity of something having some characteristic brings about a seeming transference of that characteristic from that something into the pure transparent clear crystal. Similarly, when the Atman, the individual soul, erroneously identifies itself with its temporary embodiment, it starts to assume the characteristics of the body as its own and all this trouble starts. The second chapter has established certain strong principles and their mutual connections. They are the philosophical doctrine of the soul as transcending the physical organism, the human body. The definition of Karma Yoga in clear terms and the conception of the steady-minded man, the Sthita Pragya, the Jnana Yogi. Understanding of the nature of the soul enables the practice of Karma Yoga, which in turn leads to Jnana Yoga. This Jnana Yoga brings about the complete and direct knowledge of the individual soul, Atma Sakshatkara, Self-Realization. When an emergency patient visits a skillful doctor, the doctor first gives a quick powerful mixture of all vital life-saving medicines to bring the patient back on track. A long drawn step-by-step -step treatment can then follow once the patient comes out of emergency and responds well to the treatment. This is exactly what Lord Krishna does with chapter 2. A quick and profound summary of Atma Swarupa, nature of the individual soul and the means for self-realization, the doctrines of Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga. This seems to have raised some fundamental doubts in Arjuna's mind. However, Krishna has certainly changed the mode of Arjuna's thinking. Arjuna is now on a different track and so are we. The questions are different now and that is the marvel of Lord Krishna. Jayasi chet karma naste mata buddhir janardana tatkim karma ni ghore maam niyo jayasi keshava. Arjuna says, Hey Krishna, if in your judgment 
a steady minded contemplative life a life of jnana yogi is superior to that of life of action why then do you enjoin upon me this terrible action that is engagement in war vyamishreneva vakhena buddhim mohasivame tadekam vada nischitya yena shreyo hamapnuyam by seemingly conflicting messages hey krishna you are confusing me lord direct me and lead me to my highest good while krishna is prescribing karma yoga yoga of action to arjuna and asking him to do his duty it is also true that in the earlier chapter jnana yoga the path of knowledge and renunciation is exalted above the life of action arjuna is intrigued and has fair reasons to feel that he is told of the higher ideal and advised to follow the lower arjuna has not yet grasped the central message of krishna's teaching geeta would have ended if arjuna had got it by now krishna has given the best of the best in the second chapter but arjuna has more questions we should be happy that he did not get it so soon we should be happy that arjuna is asking questions on behalf of us arjuna did not get it in two chapters most of us do not get it even after reading all the 18 chapters arjuna has not got it but he is on the right track he continues to be inquisitive he wants to know he wants to understand he is open and receptive and that is what we need to do we need to open our minds and hearts let the krishna arjuna samvada the dialogue between krishna and arjuna penetrate our hearts and then let it travel to our minds and this should be allowed without any interruptions interpretations or filters shri bhagavan vacha lokesmin vividhanishta pura prokta maya nagha jnana yogena sankhyanam karma yogena yoginam shri krishna explains the two ways of jnana yoga and karma yoga are addressed to two sets of aspirants those who are advanced in inwardness of life and have achieved mastery over the senses or prescribe the path of knowledge while those who are yet to achieve that fitness are taught the path of action nakarmana manarambham naishkarmyam purushoshnute nacha sanyasana deva siddhim samadhi gachati hey arjuna by non performance of action a man does not gain the state of naishkarmyam life of contemplation with steadfastness in knowledge of the self naishkarmyam stands for life of contemplation with steadfastness in the knowledge of the self and krishna adds by mere external abandonment he does not attain to perfection krishna calls arjuna anagha the sinless one arjuna is one with clean conscience it is such a huge compliment for arjuna to be called mr clean by someone like krishna arjuna's questions are now coming from his heart he really wants to know arjuna is no more the pundit that he was in the first chapter he is getting close to surrendering himself to the greatness of krishna but questions arise in his mind and questions arise in our minds too krishna agrees with arjuna that there are two paths the path of jnana yoga for the meditative type and the path of karma yoga for the rest the difference is however more like two different roads to the same destination rather than like two cars going in different directions the destination is the same the scenery may vary but one still has to drive to get there a gnani also has to do karma 
he may be doing different karmas than the one who is a karma yogi. This is what is so revolutionary in what Sri Krishna has to say. Everyone who is born has to do karma, has to keep acting, has to work. There is no escape from this basic truth. Arjuna believes that Jnana Yoga implies no karma, implies renunciation of action. Krishna clarifies it immediately. Krishna says, it is simply not possible. A man is condemned to do karma or you can also say that the man is blessed to do karma. Why does a man have to do karma? Why he needs to constantly act? Why is a man expected to constantly act, work, perform, do his duty? What is the driving force? What is the science behind it? Krishna says it is the three attributes of the nature, the gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas that are responsible for all the activity. We will learn more on this in the chapters to come. There is a momentum from within. The momentum comes from our samskaras, from our nature, from the, from the karmic baggage. Activity is coterminous with life and everyone is kept in activity, physical and mental, in every moment of our lives under the compulsive forces of nature. We need to realize one important factor here. Arjuna's emphasis is on karma, doing. We all have a similar emphasis. We all want to do good karma or say the right karma, the right action. And we always debate about what is that right action. Arjuna is asking the same question to Krishna. He's asking Krishna to tell him what that one thing he should do and what is that one thing, the right thing. Krishna is not evading the question. But he knows that right and wrong are but relative. Krishna is more concerned about the intentions. Why do you want to do what you do? What are your intentions? What is your state of being? Arjuna has to rise and fight. But he has to fight with equanimity, with the right attitude, with the right intention. Arjuna has to fight, but he has to fight without focusing on the results. Krishna's emphasis is more on the karta, on the doer. The question for Krishna is not what karma to do, not what action to do, but what is the state of being of the person who has to do that action. Jnana Yoga is perfect. For some exalted souls. But Arjuna, being an extrovert, a kshatriya, a soldier at heart, in reality can do better only on the path of karma yoga. A soldier has to kill. But is he killing with anger and hatred? Or is he killing without any of this? Krishna is not talking about a cold-blooded killer. He's talking about a cool-headed person. And that is why Krishna clarifies some misconceptions. There is a belief that God can be realized by renunciation of all actions. All you have to do is to leave your house and retire to the Himalayas. Krishna simply says that it is not so. No one gets to a spiritually exalted state, naishkarmyam, spiritually exalted state, by non-performance of one's duties, by quitting work. Naishkarmyam is a state of being and one can get there even while one is in the middle of all the chaos of Manhattan in New York or of Mount Road in Chennai. No one gets enlightened by just moving over to an ashram in Himalayas. So Krishna makes sure that Arjuna understands this. Giving up action, giving up our duty 
will not take us anywhere. It applies to Arjuna and it applies to all of us. Krishna's emphasis is on transformation of Arjuna's being. He is going to focus on the doer, the karta and the transformation of the being of the karta. The object of Gita is to make Arjuna a truly successful warrior. Not by teaching him warfare skills but by transforming Arjuna's being. In this process of transformation, we should ask this question, who is the master? Karmendriyani samyamya ya aste manasasmaran indriyatan vimudhatma mityacharasa vachate. Krishna says, he who restrains the organs of action but continues to brood in his mind over the objects of sensual desire, such a deluded person is called a hypocrite. Estvindriyani manasa niyam yarabhate arjuna karmendriyehi karma yogam asaktah savishishyate. This is the secret of excellence. Estvindriyani manasa niyam yarabhate arjuna karmendriyehi karma yogam asaktah savishishyate. But he who controlling all sense organs by the power of his will and lives a life of detachment and dedicated selfless action, a life of dedicated selfless actions. Such a person excels. This is the secret of excellence. Krishna is so methodical. He talks about what karma yoga is not before it goes deep into the intricacies of karma. Now he is talking about the source of any karma, the desires and the sense organs. Activity is coterminous with life and everyone is kept in activity in every moment of his life under the compulsive forces of nature. This is given. Hence this universal flow of activity must be transformed into karma yoga instead of attempting the impossible feat of stopping actions. Krishna is asking Arjuna to develop the powers of mind. And establish a control over his mind. A control over the desires and the sense organs. It is important to understand this point of Krishna. Before we try to understand the aspect of surrender. That he is going to talk about later. We are all ready to surrender. But in reality we do not have anything to surrender. We end up just desiring to surrender. Krishna first asks Arjuna. To develop control of desires by developing the strength of mind. Once the mind is there, then there is something to surrender. The mind has to be later surrendered. It has to be first conquered. So what is the difference between suppression of desires when compared to developing of mind power through exercising our resolve? Suppression is negative and it drains energy from the person. It is usually a destructive phenomenon. Resolve, on the other hand, enhances our ability to control desires without suppression. It is a simple technique. Mind is powerful and can dictate the steps to the sense organs. It can say to the sense organs what they will get and what they will not. The decision is final at the level of mind. Once the indriyas know that the decision is final, the indriyas are the sense organs, know that the decision is final, then they will keep quiet. It is much like a boss and secretary relationship. If the secretary knows that the decision is final, he she will stop arguing or discussing their point. The decision is final. The relationship between a strong mind and the sense organs is something similar. Niyatam kuru karmatvam karmajyayo hyakarmanaha sharira yatra pichate na prasadyed akarmanaha. Perform your prescribed duties, Krishna says, for karma is superior to akarma. If one is totally inactive, 
even the survival of the body would become impossible. Karma here stands for life of action versus akarma which stands for life of contemplation. But then a question arises. But actions result in bondage. Any action has a threefold effect. It produces consequences by way of the dualities of pleasure and pain, happiness and sorrow. Action creates a tendency in the performing agent to repeat the action. It results in accumulation of the karma vasanas, subtle impressions in the mind, which then curtails the natural intelligence or power of knowledge on the part of the individual soul. Therefore, the question is how to perform actions that do not bind, that are liberating in nature. Lord Krishna gives a beautiful answer. Yajnyatthat karmano nyatra lokoyam karma bandhanaha tadartam karma kaunteya mukta sangha samachara. Krishna emphatically declares all actions other than those done as yajna become causes of bondage. The binding factor is not action as such, but the motive behind the action. If the motive is self-centered and the action is performed for obtaining something from one, for oneself, then the action binds the agent, karma bandhana. Therefore, Krishna asks, work for the sake of yajna without personal attachment. What is yajna? Yajna is a terminology that we do not have a good translation in English. Krishna says that karma performed of yajna is not binding. Let us try to understand yajna. Yajna is surrendering. Yajna is dissolving. Yajna is purifying by burning. Yajna is an art. Yajna is science. Yajna is a methodology. Yajna is technology. We know that fire is used to purify gold. By subjecting gold to the fire, all impurities are removed and what remains at the end of the process is just pure gold. In Yajna, the individual is not only purified but his ego also evaporates. What remains is the pure natural self, completely rid of the sixfold impurities. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Madhamascharya. Desires, anger, greed, delusion, egotism, jealousy. And that is one reason why fire is what the purifying agent is. We see a physical fire when we burn wood or gas. There is another fire inside all of us. Every element an individual has a fire element. There is fire in love and there is fire in hatred. If you take the gross element and surrender it to the fire element, then a yajna is performed. If you take the gross element and surrender it to the fire element, then an ajna is performed. It is easy for us to physically see when we offer Homa Samagri in fire and say Swaha. The material burns and there is fragrance coming out of it. It is so obvious. But we do not see how karma, any work, any action can be a yajna. It is very important to understand that yajna is the very essence of our ethical life. The human body is molded out of the cosmic stuff, the elements of matter, and is therefore a microcosmic representation of the cosmos. It's a miniature cosmos. The constituents of the physical organism of the jiva are taken from the physical universe. The cell is reproduced from the parental life. Its food is gathered from the vegetable and animal kingdom. Its mind stuff is derived from the cosmic source and presided over by the devas, by the gods, the various forces of nature that perform functions 
assigned to them in maintaining the cosmic order. The self is a social being and cannot sustain itself without social help. Therefore, Karma Yoga is contributory selfless work that you do in participation with a larger whole. The whole here is with the W, W H O L E. The whole is an organization, a family, a nation, or even the universe itself. The work that you do becomes noble and valuable and actually can be called a duty and as work that has some value in it only if it is a sacrifice on your part by way of participation in the welfare of a larger whole to which you belong. Yajna should be the foundation of any work. There are various holes. The body itself is a whole. You have to take care of it, not torture it and kill it. The body also is an organism. It is an organization. The family is an organism, an organization. So is a state, so is a nation, so is the world, so is the whole universe. If you are in a family with five people, each member has to contribute something by way of a sacrifice of his personal interest for the welfare of the larger organization, which is a group of individuals called the family. If each one sticks to his own guns, there will be no family. It will disintegrate. A family is a consciousness. It is just not a bundle of people. It is an awareness of oneself belonging to a total whole, that which is what is called a family. It is a conceptual entity, just not a physical body. So is an organization, so is a nation, so is the universe. In each one, at each level, you have to be a participant and not to be in a position. You should be a participant in the welfare of the whole to which you belong. This is the duty that you have to perform. When duty is performed, any kind of cooperation of yourself with the whole to which you belong, the whole to which you belong, the organization ensures your success, takes care of you protects you and sees to it that you are taken care of in every way. Your success becomes an assured byproduct of your noble endeavors. If you are in disharmony with the whole to which you belong and you do any kind of selfish work, then the reaction set up by the whole to which otherwise you integrally belong will harm your endeavors. You will not reap the fruits of those actions which you have individually undertaken under the wrong impression that you will reap the fruit. You will not get anything out of selfish action because you are organically related to the whole organism of the creation of the world. This is a fact that you forget when you individually take initiatives and when you expect the results to follow from your individually motivated selfish actions. The cosmos, the universe, the cosmos is one single organism or systematic unity in which everything is interconnected. There is no gap, there is no disconnect between an atom, a cell, sense, self and society. That's why we call this interconnected phenomenon a universe and not a multiverse. The main purpose of the universe is to be the veil of soul making as a famous poet John Keats says. It is the arena where salvation is sought and secured. Yajna is only a grateful offering made by the jiva to the universe for what it has received in its psycho-physical makeup. Yajna is divided into Pitri Yajna, Deva Yajna, Bhuta Yajna, Nara Yajna and Dhamma Yajna. Pitri Yajna are the duties, our duties towards our ancestors, without whom we would not even exist. Deva Yajna, our duties towards every element of nature represented by a Deva. Bhuta Yajna, our duties 
towards various living organisms. Nara yajna or manushya yajna, our duties to the society, to fellow human beings. Brahma yajna, duties towards all the seers and sages. Yajna is selfless contributory work. Krishna then declares, Sahayajna prajasrushtva purovacha prajapatihi anena prasavishyadvam yeshavo stvishta kamadhuk. God's creation is based on the principle of abundance. At the time of creation, the Lord created all the beings with yajna as their duty and declared, it is only through yajna, it is only through selfless contributory work you can prosper and sustain abundance. Devan bhavayata nena te deva bhavayantuvaha parasparam bhavayantaha shreyaha paramavapsyata. A beautiful shloka. Krishna says, you cherish the devas with yajna and may the devas in turn bless you with bounty. Thus, mutually cherishing, you shall attain the highest good. Devas represent the elements of nature, cosmic forces conceived as spiritual and are manifestations of one supreme Godhead. Nature's bounty is a reward for worship, reverence and caring for nature. It is important to know that the whole universe is created, is designed to operate on the law of giving selflessly. Giving is the first law of all creation. Parasparam Bhavayanta is the formula for the right way of living. It is our duty to live by nourishing each other, supporting each other. Working for the welfare of we and not I. There is this interesting story. A holy man was having a conversation with the Lord and one day and he said, Lord, I would like to know what heaven and hell are like. The Lord led the holy man to two doors. He first opened one of the doors and the holy man looked in. In the middle of the room was a large round table. In the middle of the table was a large pot of soup which smelled delicious and made the holy man's mouth water. The people sitting around the table were thin, malnourished and sick. They appeared to be famished. They were holding spoons with very long handles that were strapped to their arms. And while each of them found it possible to reach into the pot of the soup with the long handled spoons, and take a spoonful but because the handle of the spoon was longer than their arms they could not get the spoons back into their mouths the holy man shuddered at the sight of their misery and suffering the Lord said you have seen hell they went to the next room and opened the door it was exactly the same as the first one there was the large round table with a large pot of the soup which made the holy man's mouth water. The people were equipped with the same long handled spoons. But here the people were well nourished and plump, laughing and talking. The holy man said, I don't understand. It is simple, said the Lord. It requires but one skill. You see, while they cannot feed themselves, they have learned to feed each other. The greedy think only of themselves and are always experiencing hell. Whereas those who have understood that it is through selfless cooperation, all can prosper. Parasparam bhavayantaha shreyaha paramavapsyata. This is the way of glorious living. Interdependence is the bedrock of all creation. For the past several thousand years, human civilization has attempted to impose its will over nature rather than studying how nature works and mimicking it. Rather than harnessing solar energy directly, 
we burn stored energy in the form of carbon. Rather than working with the natural elements in a particular ecosystem, we impose foreign species and chemicals which results in many unintended consequences. All of the crises we face today are a result of a worldview based on separation completely ignoring the fundamental fact that we live in a world of interdependence. Nature operates on the principle of enough rather than more. It does not work on the basis of greed at all. In nature, everything is food for something else. There is no concept of waste. Waste does not exist. Nature is a great model of interdependence. Today, you, like me, are breathing hundreds of gallons of invisible oxygen, a gift from our plant kingdom, to whom we return hundreds of gallons of carbon dioxide that they love so much. Meanwhile, the flowers are gifting nectar to the bees who return the favor by pollinating the flowers. Let us take the analogy of the human body, the wonder called human body which is a microcosmic representation of macrocosmic universe. If we understand the working of the human body, we can understand very well the workings of the whole universe and also understand how each of us are designed to work by nature and how we actually end up working contrary to our true nature. The human body consists of approximately 100 trillion cells, about thousand cells for every bright star in the Milky Way. All the cells of our body start from just one cell. That one cell replicates and replicates and somewhere along the line the cells differentiate. It takes only 50 replications starting with a one cell fertilized ovum to produce those hundred thousand billion cells. The first replication gives us two cells. The second replication gives us four. The third replication gives us 16 cells and so on. By the 50th replication, we have 100,000 billion cells in our body. And that's where the replication stops. There are some 250 different types of cells in the human body. From the spherical simple fat cells to thin branching nerve cells. Scientists still have no idea how that one cell ends up dividing into so many different kinds of cells which then are able to organize themselves into a stomach, a brain, skin, teeth and all the other highly specialized parts of the body. In addition to doing its specific job in the body, each cell does a few million things per second just to keep functioning, creating proteins, adjusting the permeability of its membrane, processing nutrients to name a few. Each cell also has to know what every other cell is doing, otherwise our body would just fall apart. Imagine 100 trillion cells each doing 1 million things per second, coordinating their activities so as to support a living, breathing human being, each one of us. What each cell of our body teaches us? The right perspective of life. Everything is connected. Everything looks out for everything else. Everything is in harmony with the whole to which it belongs as a part. Our body is a living example of how the universe works. A single cell that isn't connected, that selfishly looks out only for itself and that refuses to be in harmony with the whole turns into cancer. One rogue cell among billions is just enough to destroy the entire scheme of life. Fortunately, such rogue cells are very uncommon. Acceptance and humility. Cells recognize each other as equally important. Every function in the body is interdependent with every other function. Going it alone is not an option. Bonding. Due to their common genetic inheritance, cells know that they are fundamentally the same. The fact that liver cells are different from heart cells and muscle cells are different from brain cells does not negate their common identity, which is unchanging. Giving. The primary activity of cells is giving. 
which maintains the integrity of all the cells. Total commitment to giving makes receiving automatic. Hoarding is not an option. Higher purpose. Every cell in our body agrees to work for the welfare of the whole, the welfare of the entire body. The individual welfare of the cell comes second. If necessary, a cell will die protecting the body and often does. The lifetime of any given cell is just a fraction of our own lifetime. As an example, skin cells perish by thousands every hour, as do immune cells fighting off invading microbes. Just imagine 70 trillion cells able to work together for a common good. Contrast this with mere 7 billion humans who struggle to coexist here on planet Earth. So therefore, selfishness is not an option even when it comes to a cell's own survival. Contrary to all this, we end up forgetting our true nature and act selfishly all the time, constantly accumulating, constantly hoarding. There was this man who had worked all of his life, had saved all of his money and was a real miser when it came to money. Just before he died, he said to his wife, when I, when I die, I want you to take all my money and put it in a casket with me. I want you to bury me along with all my money. I want to take my money to the afterlife with me. And so he got his wife to promise him with all of her heart that when he died, she would definitely bury him and she would put all of the money in the casket with him. Well, he died one fine day. He was stretched out in the casket. His wife was sitting there with a friend. And when they finished the ceremony, just before the undertakers got ready to close the casket, the wife said, just wait a minute. She had a box with her. She came over with the box and put the box in the casket. Then the undertakers locked the casket down and they rolled it away to bury it. So her friend remarked, Hey, I know you weren't fool enough to put all that money in there with your husband. The loyal wife replied, Listen, I can't go back on my word. I promised him that I was going to put that money in the casket with him and bury him along with all his money. You mean to tell me you put that money in the casket with him? The shocked friend asked. I sure did, said the wife. I got it all together, put it into my bank account and wrote him a check. And I kept the check in his casket. And if he can cash it, he can spend it. Well, this is a joke, but also the stark reality. The reality is anyone who only accumulates without giving back to society is in reality a thief. This is not my opinion. This is what Lord Krishna says. Ishtan bogan hi vodeva dasyante yajya bhavitaha. The gods, the devas, propitiated through the rites and sacrifices, through worship, through contributory work, grant the objects of enjoyment desired by persons seeking liberation. When the devas bestow these results, bestow these objects of enjoyment, these are to be rightfully used and to be offered back to them through worship. Those who enjoy their gifts without giving their share in return are thieves, declares Krishna. Giving is therefore a fundamental part of living. Giving is a fundamental part of living. Our universe operates through dynamic exchange. Nothing is static. Our body is in dynamic and constant exchange with the body of the universe. Our mind is dynamically interacting with the mind of the cosmos. Our energy is an expression of cosmic energy. The flow of life is nothing other than the harmonious interaction of all the elements and forces that structure the field of existence. 
this harmonious interaction of all the cosmic elements and forces in our life operates on the basis of yajna, a universal law ordained by the creator, based on which creation operates. Because our body, our mind and the universe are in constant and dynamic exchange, stopping the circulation of life is like stopping the flow of blood in our body. Whenever blood stops flowing, it begins to clot, to coagulate, to stagnate. That is why we must give and receive in order to keep wealth and affluence or anything we need in life circulating in our life. A man and his son were walking in the forest. Suddenly the boy trips and feeling a sharp pain, he screams, ah! Surprised, his, he hears a voice coming from the mountain, ah! Filled with curiosity, he screams, who are you? But the only answer he receives is, who are you? This makes him angry. This makes the boy angry. So he screams, you are a coward. And the voice answers, you are a coward. Confused, he looks at his father, asking, dad, what is going on? Son, the man replies, pay attention. Then the father screams, I admire you. The voice answers, I admire you. The father shouts, you are wonderful. The voice answers, you are wonderful. Then the father explains, people call this echo, but truly it is life. Life always gives you back what you give out. Life is a mirror of your actions. If you want more love, give more love. If you want more understanding, give understanding. If you want more respect, give more respect. If you want people to be patient and respectful to you, give patience and respect. This rule of nature applies to every aspect of our life. Life always gives you back what you give out. The word affluence comes from the root word affluer, which means to flow to. Therefore, the word affluence means to flow in abundance. In every seed, is the promise of thousands of forests. But the seed must not be hoarded. It must give its intelligence to the fertile ground. Through its giving, its unseen energy flows into material manifestation. The working of the divine is out of its nature. It is spontaneous and it is just a flow. If the divine can work and produce something as miraculous as creation we see, why we cannot be able to work without the drive of selfishness? This is what Krishna is trying to point out to Arjuna. Yajna, the foundation of Karma Yoga, is the way for prosperity, is the way for abundance. Krishna continues and declares, Tasmad asakta satatam karyam karma samachara asakto hyacharan karma paramap noti purushaha Therefore, Without attachment, asaktaha, without attachment, always practice karma yoga as an end in itself. By working without attachment, that is performing contributory selfless duty, a person attains the higher goal. Tasmad asakta satatam karyam karma samachara asakyo hayacharan karma paramapnoti purushaha. Even Jnana Yogis are recommended to observe Karma Yoga. Krishna says, Karmanaivahi samsiddhim asthitha janakadayaha Loka sangrahamayavapi sampashyan kartumarhasi Lord Krishna quotes the example of King Janaka, the great emperor, father of Sita. An accomplished Jnana Yogi who in spite of qualifying to practice Jnana Yoga continues to perform Karma Yoga continues to live the life of the emperor, performing all his duties diligently and verily attain to perfection by work alone. Even though self-realized Jnana Nishtas, the practitioners of Jnana Yoga, pursuing the path of Jnana, have no need to perform any prescribed deeds, have no obligation to work, as they have nothing to gain from work and nothing to lose by non-action, Krishna 
categorically declares that for the sake of loka sangraha, welfare of the world, loka sangraha, for the sake of the welfare of the world, even they have to pursue karma yoga, continue discharging their duties without renouncing work. A beautiful shloka that highlights the essence of leadership, leading by example. Whatever the noblest persons do, the ordinary man imitates. The standards they set, the ordinary men follow. Moving on, after having emphasize the importance of karma yoga even for the jnana yogis lord krishna teaches the manner in which karma yoga is to be practiced in order to attain the higher spiritual goal of atma sakshatkara self realization what is needed for this purpose is to develop the mental attitude that the individual who performs the deeds is not the doer or agent of action the gita tells us that all actions are being done by the influence of three gunas of prakriti and not by the individual self, the embodied soul by itself. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashaha ahankara vimudhatma kartaham iti manyate. Bereft of the knowledge that the soul, the individual soul is different from the body, the person who is deluded into identifying the soul with the body looks upon the activities performed by the modes of prakriti, by modes of matter, sattva, rajas, tamas, as actions done by him. Tattva vittu mahabaho guna karma vibhaga yoho guna guneshu vartanta iti matvana sajjate. Krishna says, but who he knows the truth, the, the truth of guna vibhaga, the truth of karma vibhaga, tattva vittu, does not become attached to actions as one's own. Gunas, gunas, the three fundamental constituents of prakriti, matter. Gunas are sattva, rajas, tamas, the three fundamental constituents of matter, prakriti. So it's important to understand Guna Vibhaga, Karma Vibhaga. Guna Vibhaga, products of the three Gunas. The products of the three Gunas are the 23 Tattvas. The 23 Tattvas being the 10 organs of perception and action. Jnanendriyas and Karmendriyas. The five objects of senses, the Tanmatras. The five subtle elements, the Panchabhutas. The mind, ego, intellect. The mind, intellect, ego. So these are the all put together the 23 tattvas. The human body is nothing but an aggregate of these 23 tattvas. Guna Vibhaga. Also, the dispositions of the mind which determine the characteristic of an action are also based on the gunas. Our bodies are made of the three gunas. Our bodies are the product of the three gunas. Our mind and intellect are composed of the three gunas. Therefore, our individualities that we manifest are the products of the three gunas. All life's activities, therefore, can be classified under three heads, sattvic, rajasic and tamasic. Karma vibhaga, divisions of actions, different actions proceed from the three gunas. Actions are functions of prakriti, that is, operation of modes of prakriti. Our intellect analyzes, discriminates. The mind reflects, ear hears, eye sees, tongue tastes, hand grasps and so on. When we watch a movie, many of us get carried away and start identifying ourselves with various characters of the movie. And we become part of the movie, not realizing that the plot is just an interesting interplay among various roles of the movie. And we are just witnessing the action. Similarly, the individual soul gets carried away and starts identifying with the body, not realizing that all the actions are an interplay among various products of the gunas. Guna, guneshu, 
ವರ್ತಂತೆ ಗುಣಾಗುಣೇಶು ವರ್ತಂತ ಇತಿ ಮಧ್ವಾನ ಸಜ್ಜತೆ ಗುಣಾಗುಣೇಶು ವರ್ತಂತ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ದಟ್ ಮೂವ್ ಅಮಾಂಗ್ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ದ ಆಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ಗನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪರ್ಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಡಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಪ್ರಾಡಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ಸೊ ದೇರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ತತ್ವ ವಿತ್ತು ಒನ್ ಹೂ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟ್ರೂ ಇನ್ಸೈಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ದ ಕ್ಯಾಟಗರಿ ಆಫ್ ದೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಗುಣಾಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಹೂ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ದ ಗುಣ ವಿಭಾಗ ಕರ್ಮ ವಿಭಾಗ ಸೊ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಶುಡ್ ಆಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಟ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇಂಟೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಬಾಡಿ ಟು ದ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ that it is a product of the gunas in the shape of all instruments and perception that are moving within the sphere of their respective objects of perception guna guneshu vartanta which are also the products of the gunas and the embodied soul as a as no relation to either coolness is an inherent quality of water through contact with fire the cold water becomes hot while coolness is the inherent quality of water heat is an acquired quality similarly the natural disposition of the soul is blissful service to bhagavan any other quality is acquired when in association with the physical body it has to be understood that the doership of all activities of the material world is not inherent but acquired imposed on the soul as long as it remains embodied the agency that is the doership of the soul is not due to its inherent nature it is produced by its association with the gunas association with the body which is the product of gunas hence what is acquired and what is inherent has to be discriminated lord krishna then instructs arjuna an easier way of overcoming the sense of egoism he declares mai sarvani karmani sanyasya adhyatma chetasa nirasihi nirmamo bhutva yudhyasva vigata chvara this is an anchor shloka to be constantly meditated mai sarvani karmani sanyasya adhyatma chetasa nirasihi nirmamo bhutva yudhyasva vigata chvara by dedicating all actions to me krishna says with the mind focused on the self you fight that is you perform all your actions free from desires and selfishness and devoid of any mental anguish after stressing the importance of karma yoga lord krishna points out the difficulty one has to encounter in the observance of jnana yoga the greatest ob- obstacles that come in the way of the practice of jnana yoga are raga or attachment of senses to the objects of pleasure and dvesha or aversion when the desires to enjoy them are not fulfilled all beings including the men of knowledge are bound by the physical constitution prakriti and they are naturally attracted by the objects of pleasure owing to the influence of the latent impressions of the past lives in the mind the karma vasanas it is therefore it therefore becomes difficult to escape from the clutches of the uncontrollable senses in view of this the gita advocates that it is better to pursue one's own dharma which in the present context is karma yoga even if it is not perfect than pursuing a perilous paradharma which in the present context is jnana yoga by way of further elucidation of the difficulties involved in the practice of jnana yoga lord krishna tells arjuna in a characteristic way that there are two great enemies that confront the jnana yogi and which thwart the progress of this discipline these are kama desire and krodha anger both of which are caused by rajoguna even as smoke envelops fire dirt covers a mirror and the membrane wraps around the fetus so does desire wield the essential nature of the soul just as a piece of candy lying on the ground is covered by the flies and hence cannot be seen so too desire shrouds the self and wields its essential nature 
desires are like a big tunnel which can never be filled by anything whatever is dropped into it as a filler will only dig it deeper and deeper like a thief entering into a house through an opening puts the light out and brings the inmates under his control the thief named desire enters through the sense organs oriented towards material pleasures puts out the lamp of gnana lamp of knowledge and dominates the self engaging the sense organs in performance of karma yoga is the only way to shut off the thief called desires we also have to understand that we cannot liberate ourselves from desire by our own efforts in other words only through the grace of bhagwan we can conquer desires and his grace flows to those who are selfless who are constantly serving others nourishing others helping the needy without expecting any returns there was this man whose mission in life was to uplift others constantly serving the needy educating the children on our scriptures spreading the word of our sages and seers to all contributing to the welfare of the society and one day an angel passed by with a long list of names and a box full of gifts and inquired the addresses of all the names in the list to deliver the gifts apparently the list was all those who loved god very much the man helped the angel with the addresses even though his name was missing in the list the next day the angel appeared again in front of the man with another long list this time the list was even longer long list of names of all those who loved god and another box of gifts asking for the addresses once again the man's name was missing now the man was getting a little worried the day after the angel appeared and this time it had only one name on the list and the gift was very special the one name on the list was that of the man and the angel said while the list of names brought before were all those who loved god this special list is of those whom god loved the most mai sarvani karmani sanyasya adhyatma chetasa nirashihi nirmamo bhutva yudhyasva vikata jwaraha when one performs contributory selfless work for the welfare of all when work is done as worship dedicating all actions to the lord then one is gifted with god's grace shri ranga mangala nidhim karuna nivasam shri venkatadri shikarale kala meham shri hasti shaila shikaro jwala parijatam shri sannamami sirasa yadushaila deepam om tat sat sarvam shri krishna arpanam astu